In the musky country of northern Alberta, spring is one of the best seasons, especially when paths and trails begin to dry and, and the air isn't filled with the buzz of mosquitoes and flies yet. The Cree Indians call this time of year Sake Pakaupisim which simply means the month of appearing leaves. And it's during the time when the leaves start budding that the women start in collecting sap from birch trees. They notch the trees and then set out their containers until they're filled with that fresh, clear liquid. The sap is then put into a big pot and boiled until it becomes a thick, dark syrup. Almost as good as maple syrup. The Cree have always collected birch sap in this way. At least that's what the old people claim. Well, I'll tell you. There aren't too many places around where this activity is still going on. And it's things like this that make this place sort of different, kind of special, you know. For one thing, Chippewyan Lakes is about as far removed from civilization as you're going to find in this province. Fact is, the 25 or so families of this community are farther from any highway or even forestry road than any other permanent settlement in Alberta. Well, to be a little more technical, the settlement is tucked away near the 57th parallel almost 250 air miles north of Edmonton, Alberta's capital. Or from another point of view, it's about 90 air miles west of Fort McMurray. Well, 90 miles is a short trip by plane, but uh, if you plan to walk or come in by horseback, you may wish you'd never started. When you look at the landscape from the air, it's so empty. There's uh, so few people. Such a great, uh, vast land full of muskeg and low hills and trees and nothing. But I think it does have a kind of beauty. I think the people feel this beauty, although perhaps they don't express it very much. But they like to be outside, they like to be hunting. I think they get a kind of solitude, um, a peace of mind in the bush. Uh, the bush world is so quiet. I think the men like to get away into the bush. As a nurse stationed in uh, Dimery, I find that these people who migrate from Dimery to Chipwan Lakes are much changed. I find them much more peaceful and happy in this isolated area much more so than I do in Dimery. It's a free country for, for uh, all of us here. And uh, well, we've been trapping every winter. We didn't miss a winter to trap since we came here. And it was in 60, 68 that we moved here for, for good. And we built our houses in 69, my dad and I. And uh, we go trapping, and we made a pretty good, uh, pretty good money in Twinder. And we d we didn't have any trap lines at Wabaska, so we kind of we came. We used to came all the way from there when we were over there to trap here, and that's all everybody is doing here every winter. All the people are trapping in the winter and. 
you don't do much in the summer, but you still enjoy the the country around here. Yeah, George Beaver is uh, pretty old now. He's around 90 or over 90. He goes out to the bush to trap some sometime. I guess just past the time, but he used to trap lots when he when he was young. That's why I don't like to sit around while there's some trapping, because he, he liked it very much to trap. He, he, he likes to walk around, I think. Uh, that's what he said, anyway. He likes to walk around the bush. All the people here, all the men here, they keep them going all winter. They don't want to waste uh, much time in the winter to sit around, so they just go in the bush. Tagalog too is uh, is uh, is o is old now, but not not quite as old as uh, George Beaver is, and he he likes to go out too also, trap some sometimes. Well, all these uh, all these young young men here, uh, old men, they're, they're pretty good to. Uh, for trapping, they're, because they've been trapping since they were uh, 13 or 14, because they, were, they didn't go to school. They didn't have time to go to school, and that's the only the only thing that they wanted to do is uh, trap when they were small. <clears throat> they don't like to move out of here because. Uh, they know the country here, around here, and if they move from here to uh, south or south of here, they don't know the country pretty good, and they don't like to trap in when, was, when they don't know the country. Trapping and uh, hunting was always in good, and people are all trapping in the winter time. Sometimes they work, but mostly they trap. That's how they earn their living. Well, in the summer, it's not very much to do, but uh, you can always manage to earn your living. And sometimes they go out to the fires. A long time ago, it was a uh, new store here, a long time ago. Uh, there was a store here, but they closed it up uh, in the summer. And uh, these people here had a hard time getting groceries because they go, they have to go all the way to Wabasca to get it or to Perilous Lake. long time. And uh, since the store was here, uh, steady here, staying here in the and opening it uh, all summer, it, all these people are starting to come back now, and uh, there's a school here too now. <laughs> yes, sir. My store is a pretty important place. Because without a place to sell furs locally and to buy ammunition, fish nets, flour, and other such goods, uh, the settlement might just not be here today. Uh, you'd have to say it's more than a store. It's a meeting place, too. Sort of like the old-time general store used to be. 
and people can sit around and catch up on the latest gossip or plan the next moose hunt, maybe, or talk up a little business with a friend. Now, the man operating this outfit is Fred Gingrich, along with his wife, Elsie. Now, they came to this country from Iowa mm -hmm. 15 years ago. Seems they came as school teachers, and well, I don't know how long they'd planned to stay, but once they got to know the people and the land, they decided this was home. When they got involved in the store business, they really got taken up with it. Fred eventually bought a plane and began flying in supplies to give the people here better service. So nowadays, Chippewyan Lakes has a variety of city goods flown in weekly. Store owner, bush pilot, and fur buyer. That's quite a change from school teacher. By the end of May, even those men with trap lines farthest from the settlement are back home with family and friends. Well, Julian Cardinal here is one of the last to return, being that his trap line is over 40 miles away. But what really makes one stop and think is that he walked the distance through rough muskeg country in less than two days, and he had to pack his load of furs. <laughs> I'll wager that there aren't many hikers going to match that kind of walking unless they've lived like the people in these parts. And Julian was able to bring back some fine lynx pelts, which meant trapping was pretty good on his line. He figures on getting 45 or more dollars for each pelt when he takes them to the store. <laughs> Summer always seems to bring a certain calm to the community, mainly because there's fewer people around. By midsummer, a fair share of the men and older teenage fellas may be out fighting forest fires or out on what they call standby duty. Uh, you can't keep a good man from hunting as long as there's moose out in the muskeg. <laughs> He'll get out any chance he can. More than anything, fewer residents means that families are out visiting relatives in other settlements. And they say it's always been that way in summer. In the past, this movement started as soon as trails were passable, but with school, it's not quite the same now. So June is a waiting month waiting for school to close, that is. Instinct. On the end, eh? Instinct. Okay. What is instinct? Instinct. 
think is what animals know without learning. Okay? Animals know things without learning. Uh, birds, ducks. Where do the ducks go in the winter time? No. So. Why do they go south? Who told them to go south? Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> they know, eh? Okay, the next word. The suffix on the end. What's this word? Low, lumpy, O, B, B, O, B, D, E, N. Very good. Obediently. Like I said, Chip Wyatt Leakes is snuggled away in the wilderness. Nonetheless, they still get a taste of civilization. First of all, the school develops new ideas. And in the store, there's things from the city. Be it canned bacon or transistor radios. On the other hand, youngsters are equally reminded that ways of their forefathers are still important to their way of life. Now, you take Arnold Orr, for example. He's a craftsman that uses methods and skills passed on from his father. You can see what I mean as he works on a drum. Drum isn't too difficult to make, maybe, but you sure have to know what you're doing. The first problem comes in selecting the right wood. Usually it's birch or willow that must have straight grain and very few knots. This piece of wood is then cut into board shape and left overnight to dry before the craftsman begins planing it. <laughs> Nothing fancy about Arnold's tools. An axe and a knife are the main tools. The knife he uses is one he made specially for this kind of work, though it'd seem easier with a store-bought plane. But he has fine control over the knife, so he can get the board to exactly the right thickness. This is where experience shows up. If the wood has been selected with care and planed carefully, the drum frame should bend without cracking or splitting. If it cracks, well, that's about as far as you go with that drum. Once it's known the drum frame will bend into a circle the way it should, Arnold clamps it down. When this task is completed, he prepares the frame for cross pieces that keep the frame in position when drying, and the cross pieces are later removed. Now, usually two or three days are needed for the drum frame to dry out, and, uh, well, in warm weather it's placed outside. Otherwise, it goes inside the cabin somewhere near the stove. Oh, <laughs> 
When he figures it's dry enough, holes are drilled about an inch apart around the frame in preparation for the drum head or rawhide cover. Moose is the easiest to come by, so its hide is used for most things made of leather. But in this case, well, Arnold decided to use a piece of inland caribou hide that was given to him by a relative. It's not as tough as moose hide, but it'll give a good sound to the drum. The last problem in this whole operation is to stretch the rawhide evenly over the frame, and then lace it down so that you don't end up with a drum head as wrinkled as a washboard when it dries. Well, it all boils down to skill and know-how, learned just as Arnold's grandson has been doing. And so, tradition is passed on. Tradition. Yeah. It's the value you place on your heritage. And you talk about pride. Uh, you'll find it among the people of Chippewa Lakes. And it's pride in being Cree. A story of feeling kinship and harmony with the land. And that's probably the real reason why they've remained in an isolated community where they can hunt and fish, where they can trap or tan hides. The question is, can this existence continue much longer? The way things stand now, younger couples haven't drifted too far from tradition. But more and more, these families realize the importance of money to get by today. For example, the, the hide Harriet is tanning will be taken to the store and sold. But you can't stop so-called progress. Life in the settlement, you know, it'll be different as the youngest generation faces a, a rapidly changing world. Uh, they're going to read and write and 
Maybe they won't have time to set traps or make moccasins. Or maybe this kind work will no longer be useful. But they won't forget their heritage. No. They'll keep the old ways alive in stories, songs, and books, or wherever they meet. But then, Chipwine Lakes will no longer be sort of special, except in the hearts of those who knew it as it was. When we went down to the river, it was raining and cold, so we couldn't get no moose. We seen a lot of tracks, so we couldn't find any moose down at the river. We stayed there for two days. Then I had to come, come back. For TV is to use it for, uh, you can uh, sleep in it and uh, you can smoke things or meat or fish and it's pretty good, uh, good. it's uh, pretty handy to be, to use a, a TV. Well, everybody knows that he can't live only with just bannock and lard. We've got to try and get something anytime. When my dad was here, when he was trapping, he used to was telling me that uh, used to be about two stores here one time in the winter. Uh, I guess there was some uh, firm buyers that were here and they bought up the stores. There was a lot of boxes that time. That's what my dad said. I just don't know for that two seconds. Uh, as far as I can hear it, he can do anything. He can fly with us to his body. But everywhere he wants to go. But I just don't know what kind of a person he was. I have a lot of story of him. I don't remember. I heard there was one old guy he used to live around here. He was telling a story for seven days and he didn't finish. This place, Chipaya Lakes. This is old story. Some old people follow the old ways, but I think it's going to change pretty soon.